Hello everyone. This uh, quick video is going to be a review of what we already talked about at either a keynote or a breakout session. So again, it's not the full version, but it will allow you to revisit some of the things that we talked about if you need to go back and visit a website. Again, we call this the UnClassroom. My name is Curtis Chandler. You can reach me via email contact at the end of the slides. Basically, I've been able to travel from classroom to classroom over the past couple years. And what I'd really like to do is just show you some of the exciting things that I feel really lucky to have seen in other people's classrooms. Okay? If we talk about being able to visit other people's classrooms, the one thing we seem to look for is what do teachers do best to engage our students. So one of the places that I was really fortunate to visit with, uh, places I was able to visit and teacher I was able to work with, was Joe Masiello from Delaware. Now, Joe Masiello, this is basically what his kids do. He was given a list of terms that his kids needed to learn for the ACT slash SAT, so he wanted to accelerate the content. So what he did is, is a song and dance, something very non-linguistic, to help them remember what each of those terms were. And so here's a quick example. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it. See how it goes. And from there, the students begin to give their testimonials of why they love the wall word song. So they'll say things like, it's engaging, it's fun, it helps me remember. Now what's going to happen is somewhere at the SAT or ACT, they're going to come across one of those words, and the kid will start to move around and dance, and someone's probably going to tell them, sit still, be quiet. And that's unfortunate because it seems like we spend a lot of times in most of our classrooms getting kids to sit still, be quiet, to learn things that are largely boring and unimportant to their world. So here's an example of a teacher that accelerated the content by doing something the opposite of what most people did. What his experience in school was like, the opposite of that. And that's one way we could look at the unclassroom. He also has his kiddos design non-linguistic representations to go along with each of their words. Let's go to a different classroom. I think the next place we're going to go is... Let me double check here. It takes me just a second. Oh, looks like we're going west. We're going to go to Bozeman, Montana. Um, here's another teacher I was able to visit with and see how he's doing a version of the unclassroom as well. This is mad scientist Paul. That's what I call him. His name is Paul Anderson. He's a fantastic teacher. And his class looks completely different than anything I've seen. It's actually designed like angry birds. It's leveled and it's self-paced. So the kids have all of these biology labs, experiments, and assignments, learning activities that they complete at their own pace, and they can do them more than once. And so they move at their own speed their own pace and they can pass these off and he's actually a facilitator in the process rather than up front and I asked him what the biggest change has been he said you know what it's just a completely different change from the traditional role of the teacher he is a facilitator and the kids are engaged because he has designed his version of the unclassroom now I looked at this and something seemed familiar these kids were engaged in ways that you usually don't see them but I, I thought I remember seeing this somewhere and after a while it occurred to me that it was very much like a reading intervention program that I was able to visit same type of thing levels um, the interventions were, were stacked in ways where the kids could access them and revisit them again and again. And it seemed like they were, they were trying to pass them off as quickly as they can and to revisit those. And it was an interesting setup. Let's go one other place. Not too far from home. Uh, again, we're starting from my middle school every single time there. Just for symbolic reasons, this is where we've gone. Uh, this is not too far away. This is over in the Kansas City area. We're able to visit the classroom of a middle school teacher, and he taught social studies. In his classroom, for all intents and purposes, look like it was a mess. This is what it looked like. This was me and uh, several of the other teachers visiting the classroom. And it looked like just a ridiculous museum slash garage. But his motto was, see it, hear it, touch it, build it. And so he's constantly, instead of using textbooks, lecturing, they're handing around artifacts that he's collected. They're discussing them. The kids are trying them on, trying them out. And if you talk to his students, they never, ever forget the content nor the experiences that they've had in that classroom. So you start to ask yourself, what should a classroom look like? Well, Joe Masiello said it should look like a Broadway musical. That was the first example I, I showed you where the kids were moving and dancing around. Uh, Mad Scientist Paul, his class is designed like Angry Birds. The last one we showed you was a museum. I actually spend time talking to university professors about how we can turn our classrooms into things that resemble more video games, one of the most engaging uh, forms of media that we have today. 
But regardless, the consensus seems to be it should be anything but a classroom. And so when we talk about what is the unclassroom, it seems to be anything other than what you or I grew up with. And for all intents and purposes, this is what it looked like. I mean, this looks like most classrooms, unfortunately. Even if you look, we've got a smart board, or sorry, we just have a projected screen. We might have some interactive technology somewhere, but it still looks like the exact same classroom that you or I grew up with. Kids are facing the teacher, some of them with their heads down. They don't look really engaged. One person is lecturing, and they've probably completed their reading assignments. Look, this guy's turned around like, what is going on? Maybe a classroom could look like this, an unclassroom. Or like this. Or like this. But regardless, it shouldn't look like this. The unclassroom needs to be the opposite. So let's do a little exercise here. If you were in charge of teaching your elderly relative how to use their first smartphone, what would you use? Okay, this is high stakes stuff, right? You have somebody who needs to adapt and use the technology. It's going to best serve them, but you don't have a lot of time. Would you lecture them? Would you make them read the instruction manual that comes with the smartphone? Would you use some sort of audio visual demonstration, like a YouTube video that walks them through that? Uh, would you demonstrate for them? Would you discuss it with them? Would you have them practice by doing it? Would you actually have them do that, learn it, and then teach it to somebody else? Now, depending on our preference, we might pick two or three of these, but chances are we are not, we are not going to pick the ones that are at the top. Because we know when the stakes are high, in an example like this, that lecture and having them read isn't the most effective use of their time, and it's not going to help them master the concept. Which is interesting, because when we talked about the brain-based research, think five, eight years ago, where everybody got excited. We all agreed that, that lecture and reading were pretty much ineffective only have a 5%, 10% chance of learners actually retaining what it is that they experience via that format. And they get more and more powerful as they descend and take ownership of the learning process. We don't lecture. We don't have them read whenever possible. Here's a more visual format somebody else has coined. I kind of like this because what we're really talking about is if we looked at how we do things, we could say as often as we can in an unclassroom, let's just chop off the top half of the pyramid. Okay? Let's get rid of that lecture. And instead, we're left with what? We're left with the use of audiovisual, have them demonstrate, involve them in discussion, practice by doing, and eventually teaching others. And those get more and more powerful. And we can always use combinations of these as well, obviously. All right, let's start with audiovisual. Since this, is, this presentation was actually geared for a technology sector, instructional technology visit, we'll start there. Okay? We'll talk about how do we use audiovisual more effectively. Now, this is a little chart I've come up with, and this is experience as well as research. We'll show you at the end. One way we could use it is to support attention and motivation. We can have students come in and on our smart board, our Promethean board on projected surface, have videos playing of engaging things that introduce topics. Okay? We could add aesthetic appeal, humor. Uh, you visit conferences and workshops every now and then. You'll have presenters who do this. They'll show a, a, an energetic clip just to get the crowd going. How about representational, to illustrate a concept in a realistic fashion? When we have to teach students about, uh, I don't know, splitting atoms, the creation of antimatter, what better way to do that with a realistic video clip or an animation, something that was actually de designed by CERN, for example. And we'll show you some examples of that later on when we get to the Rube Goldberg machines. Mnemonics, how about to provide retrieval cues of information? When we introduce parallel episodes in my class, we do this. We say, today we're going to talk about parallel episodes. What are we going to talk about? Parallel episodes, and then they chime in. And so to help you remember this, we're going to watch Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We watch this old creepy version of it, and then when it's done, we say, all right, now what are some things that you saw repeated again and again? And they start to rattle off some things where she said, well, um, the, the little girl broke into their house, which is pretty much breaking and entering, but went into their house and said, well, the porridge is too hot, too cold, just right. The chairs were too hard, too soft, just right. And they recognize that those were repeated. And we say, okay, students, those are parallel episodes. And so we say, when you get to that question anywhere, and you have to remember what parallel episodes re is, remember that mnemonic. Remember Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So there's an example of we're using a mnemonic, a video clip to anchor that in. How about building background information for generating discussions? Um, we did a Socratic seminar on ethics and second life. Um, half of the students had never even heard of Second Life. So what do we do? We level the playing field with a video clip of that so they can discuss it. And it's interesting. A lot of your reading intervention programs now have built in video clips to level the playing field because you have students of various experiences. They have to read about beavers, and two-thirds of your students have no idea what a beaver really is. So you can level the playing field, build background information for generating discussions, and doing other assignments. Okay, next one. How about minimizing the cognitive load? 
uh, we teach Romeo and Juliet in eighth grade to students. Um, we spend much of our time watching the video with the subtitles on, as Shakespeare might have intended it to be performed. But we want them to see the text and discuss that, but to minimize that cognitive load. This is their first experience with Shakespeare. We turn that video on so they can see what it's actually like. There's an example. Um, when I'm gone. Today, for example, when I'm supposed to be doing, uh, when I'm on this workshop, uh, my students have uh, my hands and a book in front of them in front of a webcam. And I'm talking them through it, and I'm doing guided reading, and all they see is the book. There's an example of minimizing the cognitive load through video. You can do guided reading, put books in front of a webcam, have them follow along and mark certain things and make annotations, read aloud to them, and it's helping to minimize the cognitive load. And the last one we're going to spend a little bit of time on later on, so I don't want to give away that too much. But really it's this, allowing students to create videos to demonstrate mastery of content. And we'll spend some more time on that. Okay? But if we talk about using audiovisual more effectively, those are some ways that we could do it. Now, if we get to the really bottom part of the pyramid, that's where the real power begins. Demonstration, discussion, practice by doing, teaching others. So let's take a look at that. What if instead, instead of just showing videos, we do more allowing students to create those? And we do that because video is by far the most flexible format for final projects. Anything can take the shape of a video and be shared on a YouTube page, on a class website, uh, via Facebook, anything like that. So here's an example. We had a teacher who came um, to one of the workshops and said he wanted to do more with student-based creativity. So where does he start? He jigsaws the content. He makes this group in charge of this type of rock, this group in charge of this type of rock, and so on and so forth. And then he says, each of you has to create a funny music video that teaches the content and is funny. What are the two requirements? Teaches the content and is funny. So you have all these different types of rock video clips that they put together, and they called it appropriately rock band. I don't know how well you're going to be able to hear this, but do your best. So there's your example. And so what he did is he had his students take ownership of it. They created these little projects. He montages them together. And the kids, you actually find them humming these little tunes. Sediment, igneous, metamorphic, sediment, igneous, metamorphic. And these are the ways that they remember. But he has student-created examples that he can share with other classes, introduce content. But the coolest thing is, is how he's using it. He's using the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. Now the real question is, what does this look like in my classroom? I teach language arts, for example. So I can actually put kids in front of a webcam, have, have them uh, do a dramatic reading and use some little hand puppets to summarize or to retell some of the most important parts of a book like Treasure Island, for example. This is Treasure Island, Chapter 1. The old sea dog at this Admiral Bimbo. It starts off with a sunny beach and Admiral Bimbo in the distance. Shows a man walking up. Now, you can look that up on the... On the school YouTube page anyway, okay? Just look for WMS students and you'll find that. So we have them retell some of the parts of their text. And you could do that with a nonfiction text as well. Have them act it out in front of a webcam, okay? You can actually do anything. What, we, what else we've done is uh, take certain concepts and say, all right, these are the key concepts for the unit. You choose two or three and do a little handsy movie that explains this. Now I'll cut this off, but you'll get the gist of it. English shorts. Today we'll be talking about flashback, foreshadow, Flashback is to interrupt the present into the past. Now, he goes through and does little jokes and has little pictures that go along with it, but you get the gist. Identify the key content or terms. 
let them take ownership and give them the same rules that the other teacher did. Make sure it teaches them in a way that's accurate and that it's funny. Give them several examples. Um, make sure you do a first take with them so you can check the content as the content expert, but let the students chime in and help them to become a little more creative. So as long as you've got it set up in a way that you can foster that creativity and also check it for content, these projects are very, very effective. Ultimately, what we want is this. We want to foster classroom creativity. We want students to start to ask things like, Mr. or Mrs. blank, would it be alright if I did instead? And when we can get students to start asking that, we're really doing our job. And folks, whenever a student asks, can I do it my own way, the answer to that should always be yes. Then as a teacher, all you need to do is step in, clarify the objectives of the assignment, and then check it for content and accuracy. And then they get to take ownership of that. I had a student come to me and say, well, can I do a diorama for Treasure Island, my two chapters? Two requirements were, is it accurate and is it funny? Okay, so can you make a diorama accurate and funny? Oh, sure, I can do that. So I check in as the content expert, clarify the expectations as the teacher, as the grown-up, and then they come up with the diorama. Now here's an example of one. Again, I think the volume's a little off, but you get the gist of it. This is my diorama of chapter 21, The Attack. And over here you have the, the boats that they sailed up on shore with, and there's a pirate coming for the stockade. And here's the provisions that they lost when they got dumped over. And there's the pirate that they killed with the other two coming out the stockade and an alligator eating the dead guy. We'll stop it there. But you get the gist of it. Legos, semi-funny. You've got an alligator eating the dead, dead guy, relatively funny. This student actually took the assignment to three or four chapters because he wanted to do more. And you think about what skills he's using. He's organizing information, synthesizing content, arranging it spatially, part to whole relationships. This is a young man who's going to do something with his head in his hands. He's never going to use Treasure Island again. But because he wanted to take ownership on his own, and the teacher said, okay, let's see what we can do. He actually turned it into something that was probably useful for him and something that he was proud of as well. Okay? And that's what we talk about when we say, allow students to demonstrate mastery of content. One of the best ways to use audiovisual effectively. Okay? Bottom half of the pyramid, well, when they take ownership of it, that's really where we get. Instead of us just using audiovisual as a teacher, then the students get to use it as a medium for doing these skills that we want them to do. And they're going to retain the content. Now, the argument that we make at instructional technology conferences is this. Technology accelerates and facilitates all of these. And that's one of the reasons why we get so excited about technology. If you take an assignment that's kind of common at uh, summer science camps, basic engineering challenge, build a Rube Goldberg machine that will turn on a light. Now, I was actually working at one of these camps and had a little break and I was going from room to room. This is what I saw. I saw one group that just had this mess going on, which is fine. And I asked them what they were up to. And they said, well, we're building a machine. And I said, oh, you mean a Rube Goldberg machine? And they just looked at me confused. And they said, well, a machine. I said, what does your machine do? And they said, we don't know. It's supposed to, like, turn on a light. So we're going to put it right here, like in this light socket. And we think, and so they weren't really grasping what a Rube Goldberg machine was. They'd heard it had to turn on a light, but they just thought it was, went next door, same assignment, different teacher, and the kids were working like crazy. They were well on their way designing something that looked like an apparatus, like a Rube Goldberg machine. And so... I asked the teacher, well, what did you do that was different? And she looked at me and I, she said, what do you mean? I said, well, the kids next door are really, really confused. And she said, well, as soon as I saw the kids start to get confused and we were explaining it, we, used, we just Googled real quick a video example of a student-created Rube Goldberg machine. And this is what we showed the kids, one that turns on a light. So it starts with a cell phone and at the end it turns on the light. Watch the light. Here it comes. And the light comes on. Voila. Okay? So there's an example of a teacher who said, look, I can accelerate this process if I use technology to provide an example. Okay? I also like to talk about the power of simulations. I think simulations are one of our best but yet underused tools. I'll give you an example from my son. I have four boys at home, and I came to the supper table, and one said this, quote, Want to know how a bill becomes a law? And he was talking to his brother. And I was intrigued by this because most of the time when we ask our boys, what did you learn at school? They say things that usually kids say, I don't know. 
but he was explaining something that he learned at school. And so he was telling me all about the steps of a bill becoming a law. I talked to his teacher about it later on and just asked her, how is it that you, you taught this concept? And this is what she said. She said, well, what we do is we start by singing that song, I'm Just a Bill from Schoolhouse Rock. We watch it once and then we sing along with the subtitles. Okay? She said, then we have kids like yours come up with an idea. And I said, well, what was my kid's idea? She said, your kid decided that we should all have porcupines as domestic pets. And I said, well, what did you think of that? She said, well, I thought it was an interesting idea. So I said, now just go to the next step, which is what all the kids did, is to take your idea, okay, and then walk through the steps of the simulation. They simulated the steps of a bill becoming a law inside the class. So there's an example of the power of a simulation. And the result was my kid retained the content, was so excited about it, he wanted to tell his brothers about how a bill becomes a law. I um, visited a military installation just recently, and we were able to participate, here's me, okay, looking pretty excited because I'm figuring I'm going to dominate these other teachers that were on this project with us. We we're going to go into these tank simulations where we could go in, and I, I play a little bit of video games, so I figured I'm definitely going to dominate. Well, we get inside, and it's absolutely realistic. It's like the inside of a tank. By the way, I'm claustrophobic, so that's my first excuse. Well, when it's all said and done, what the uh, military is able to do is to do most of their training through simulations, and why would they do that? Well, because they can accelerate the learning process and they don't have to use up their resources. Okay? So we take a look at that. What if we did a virtual Rube Goldberg machine built in something like a virtual sandbox? Because the problem with some of these uh, science camps that I was able to visit were yeah, they're great ideas, but as soon as the kids ran out of materials, then they were just stuck. So we'll take the example of Incredibots 2. Incredibots 2 is an example of a, a virtual sandbox that you can use. Um, students can design basic, simple machines, but you can also you can also use it to design things as complex as Rube Goldberg machines. So let's find that real quick. Okay, I might have to restart it here, so we'll see how we do. Okay, let's move this over where you can see it. Oh, wrong one. Try that again. Sorry about the delay, folks. All right, here we go. Same concept, but instead of recyclable materials. Okay, now let's restart that real quick, okay? Now what you're going to look at is it's going to start right here. Down, 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 down. Let's make that full screen. Try that one more time, folks. Okay, it's going to start here, and it's going to finish right there. Fifth try is a charm, right? Here we go. Ready? So you see all the pieces moving. and so on and so forth. And eventually what happens is, here we go, hits, hits, hits. That ball is going to go, knock it over, flip something over, and it's going to end up right there. But you get the gist of it. Now what do they do? Here's an example of an assignment where someone could build a Rube Goldberg machine in a virtual sandbox. They could simulate it. Okay. So this is what I'd like you to do. When you get a chance, I want you to Google Colorado simulations. And what you'll do is you'll come to a website that says this, fetcolorado.edu. And these are fantastic simulations, primarily for science and math content, but you can use them for other things as well, categorized by topic, but also by grade level. And so if you go to these, you will find a bunch of simulations that you can use with your students. I'm a language arts teacher, and we found them, one that we used as we were doing some nonfiction reading about fast food, wellness, and exercise. There's actually one in here that says wellness and exercise. We'll show you this one real quick. Now these run in Java. And you can download them or you can do them right off the web. And they're all free. Alright. Now what happens is, with these simulations, kids are able to explore and interact with the content rather than just read about it. We're getting them down to the bottom of the pyramid, no doubt. 
starting up. Sorry. All right, so here we go. So let's enter me in my, my dream body, right? Look, you can change it between English and metric. I'm a male here. Um, I'll be moderately active. And if you click on those, it actually gives definitions for the kids. So let's make me... Well, I'm now an NFL quarterback. Check this out. 27 years old. 6'5". Will make me 220 pounds. Nice. Reduce my body fat. So it gives you your heart strength. Okay, your heart strain, body mass index, and so on and so forth. Now, this is the exciting part where the kids can actually go in and add in what they eat on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? So they can add all that food in. They can also enter in, like, their exercise habits. Like, let's say they bike for 10 minutes a day. It tells you how many calories they're going to burn. And then from there, they can actually start the simulation, and it collects data over time. So their weight changes based on their exercise versus their food. Their intake is charted here, and it collects data, and they can reflect upon that. Well, then you can clear it all off and change it to a completely fast food diet, which is the experiment we wanted our students to run safely. And you'd be amazed at the, the conversations that the students had about uh, health and wellness based on that. Look what happened to my heart, Mr. Chandler, and oh my goodness, you'll never guess what happened to me based on the fast food thing. They were really excited to interact and explore that content. And again, there are several, several of those if you Google Colorado simulations. Okay? So again, if you Google Colorado simulations, you'll find a bunch of those sorted. Now, that's what we're talking about when we said technology accelerates and facilitates the unclassroom. The unclassroom basically means this. Let's just look at other models. Um, this is the Discovery Science Center in Topeka, Kansas. Okay? Um, I had to go do some work there, and I was actually supposed to be working. You can see my computer there, unattended. Instead, I was wandering around looking because you had all these kids that were doing all these uh, fantastic learning experiments. There was this one that I had to wait for kids to leave. I was trying to wait for the kids to leave so I could get a better picture of it, but they didn't leave until it closed down for lunch, where it talked all about your pulse, and the students uh, would put their hands right here and connected to a drum. It would measure their pulse and sit there and beat it. And it had all these little experiments that they had to do go along with it. They had another one that was this. And I know this one's a little blurry, but we'll do our best here. Where kids take, get my mouse here. Kids can take all these objects and they put them up on this crank and it launches them off the top. And they try and time it to see how long it stayed in the air. Then they can try and assemble different objects using these various shapes and build gliders. And so they're experimenting with with the principles of flight. Had a lot of foot traffic on that one as well. This is by far the busiest one. This was this great uh, clear wall. The kids could just go paint and erase again and again and again. And the kids were just having a blast with that. This is the director. I believe her name was Maggie. And I just asked her. I said, I know Topeka is one of the last places to get one of these. How did you guys choose which experiments to put here? And she said basically she was really excited because she got to travel with a group of people from Discovery Center to Discovery Center to Children's Museum around the country. And what they did is they chose the very best. And so I asked her, I said, well, how do you choose the very best activities when all of them are so engaging? And this is what she said. She said, we chose the ones that got the most users. Um, they were the most hands-on. They tend to be the messiest. And when you talk to the kiddos, they tend to be the least, they tend to be least like the activities that the students were doing in school. And so there's a lesson in the unclassroom. Here's an establishment that is trying to make learning as interactive and productive as possible by being the antithesis of what we do in schools. They are literally building the unclassroom. Now, we can look at other models, right? We can start to ask ourselves, why is it that my second grade son wants an iPod Touch? Why does my second grade son want an iPod Touch for Christmas? And if you ask him, he'll say things like, like this. Well, I'm having fun with it. You know, I, I can get lost in it um, when I play my friends. It gives me control and choice. I get to be creative, multiple attempts to solutions to a problem. So you can tell that these aren't his responses, but when you start to think through them in teacher's terms, this is what he's saying. I get clear movement towards a goal. Um, I can get feedback from it. I get to move around in some of these games. It's interesting as you talk to kids and ask them, why are you so engaged in this or in this or whatever it is they're engaged in, they tend to give these types of answers. And these aren't brain busters or breakthroughs. These are what... Uh, Meta-analysis says works best in our classrooms, but we tend not to focus on those until we sometimes take a really good hard look at what kids would rather do rather than being in school, like an iPod. Same thing, my fourth grade son, why does he enjoy playing his Tron game on the Wii so much? 
And if you haven't played Tron, here you go. I mean, it's, it's a fun game. It's not definitely the most popular game, but it allows the kids to race cycles, light cycles, side by side, and they get to jump and rumble and so on and so forth. They also get to design their own characters from scratch and modify those. These are typical characteristics of video games. And as you start to ask kids, why is it do you love video games so much? They'll give you the same types of answers. If we start to make our classrooms more like this, then I think we better engage our students. And the most effective teachers do, do just these. James G., professor at Arizona State University, um, big wig on games and education, um, specifically video games and education. And he and other educators say it this way. This is my version of it. Any educator with half a brain, there's your half a brain, will acknowledge video games as a powerfully motivating digital environment. Okay? If we have half a brain, we're going to acknowledge that. If we have a full brain, we're going to attempt to study video games in order to determine how can motivational components of those games could be integrated into our instructional design. How do we make our classrooms more like video games? Okay. And I think we do that through those ways. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of these. Being more fun and more immersive. I walked into a classroom where a teacher was teaching the connection between Rasputin and the Romanov family. Not the most engaging dynamic content. But the kids walked in and she had this Wii game up and the kids joined in to Ra Ra Rasputin. So the kids were doing this along with it. They were going. Here it comes. Now, this is what she has playing. She's handing out the song lyrics as the kids come into the song. And they, as soon as the song stops, she says, you know what we're going to learn about today? And the kids are like, no, but it's going to be fun. She says, absolutely. Today we're going to talk about Rasputin and his connection to the Romanov family. You'll never forget this guy. And they look at the song lyrics and they mark out all the stuff that's historically inaccurate. That's most of the song. Then they circle the stuff that is actually accurate. They add in a few more facts. And she says, all right, that's everything you need to know for your assessment about Rasputin and the Romanovs. What questions do you have about them? So there's an example of a more fun, immersive environment for the kids. The name of this song is Rara Rasputin. It's based on Rasputin and a loose historical interpretation of his life. Regardless, she thought it was fun and immersive for her kids. Now here's another professor that made his class completely immersive. And you can find the rest of that video by Googling Mike Wesh, Kansas State University, at YouTube. And what he basically did is it's an introductory cultural anthropology class. I took a class, but I hate to say that I took it from the wrong professor. I didn't take it from this gentleman. And what he did was this. He looked at his classroom and said, I'm, I think I'm really excited about this content. The kids don't really care for it, but it's really, really cool stuff. And why is that? And when he looked at the lecture format, that is what was killing the experience. And so he said... Well, how could we simulate what it is that we're trying to teach? And so instead of lecturing and doing all that, he simulates the entire world history. And so his class actually looks like little countries. It models the map that they set up. Kids are assigned to certain countries, and then they walk through steps of colonization. Okay? Um, they simulate wars and so on and so forth. And these are the supplies that they have. They have natural resources that they're divvied out. They have to trade for them. And he walks them through the steps of colonization, of of different uprisings and so on and so forth and they actually experience the content and it's just an amazing setup truly the unclassroom and at any given day you visit and these kids know what they're doing and they will never ever forget it now the real question is what does my classroom look like I would like it to look more like this more experiential more simulated the bottom part of the pyramid more like an unclassroom but too often I find myself and many of my colleagues experiencing this Another thing you can do is provide control and choice. That's what video games do. So in this case, we have kids do completely uh, identical assignments, reading practices, writing prompts, some creative stuff, where we looked at two different amusement park rides that have emerged. This is the Flow Rider. It's a stationary surfing wave. I'll show that to you real quick. Hold on. And this one is a stationary skydiving chamber. And so what the kids actually do is... Uh, they have similar assignments with the reading practices, the writing prompts, but they get to choose between the two. Kids enjoy video games, grown-ups as well, because there's often choice involved. 
So as much as we can allow kids to have control and choice, that motivates them to do more. You can also give them control and choice. We won't spend tons of time on this. Uh, you can look it up on the website as well. But you can ask a kid, okay, we're at the end of the novel, for example. You can either do this, this, or this. So here's an example of a kid who wanted to just act out his favorite chapter. Chapter 1. The old sea dog at this So he does the cute puppet show with it. Another kid wanted to do a scrapbook. This is my scrapbook from the Treasure Island book um, by Robert Robert. So a little pixelated, but you can see it. Another kid comes forward and says, hey, can I do my own way? The answer to that is always yes. So he created an am animation for a couple chapters of Treasure Island. Well, it looks like we're stuck on this ship until we can find a way to get back. I'm too drunk to know how to get back, so Jim, we're going to have to start your training at once. You don't mean... Yes, Jim, you're going to be a pirate. <gasps> and so this goes on for a while. Now, the other thing we can do is, so I guess again, provide control and choice as often as you can. Another thing we can do is just emphasize what video games emphasize. Creativity, multiple attempts, and solutions to a problem. When we give kids problem-based challenges, and say, look, there's more than a way to get there. I'm only going to give you these two or three rules. Here's an example of a classroom um, in Kansas as well where the students were designing balloon cars. And the only rules or regulations they put out were you can only use these types of materials and we're going to have a contest to see who can goes, whose car, balloon car can go the furthest and the fastest. And it has to be powered by the balloon. So they had all these different designs that the kids were able to put together. But the emphasis was on different ways to get the same project done. And then after that, revisit the best examples and say, okay, if we were to reprototype, what sort of things would we change if you were to redesign again? Okay? And that's one thing I don't think we can emphasize enough. Too often our students do something once, the final date is there, and then they don't revisit it anymore. Where, if we look at what goes on in the business world, we're continually adapting and readapting based on the needs of our consumers. And so revisiting a prototype again and again is a good way to teach that skill. Another thing we can incorporate from video games into learning is clear movement towards goals through feedback and so on and so forth. And remember those two are often integrated. We want our students to understand which direction they're headed in, have an involvement in that, but as often as we can, get their feedback about what we can change about our learning experience. What sort of technologies should, should we be using based on what they think? Some of the most effective tools I've been able to use in my classroom and, in, and help with other classrooms are the ones that the students actually suggested because often they are the experts and the most user-friendly tools. Uh, my college professor, for example, one of them, this is Dr. Michael, uh, Dr. Marcus Childress at Emporia State University, a blended model, an educational model, but also kind of a private se sector technology model is the instructional design department. And I was really excited about his classes, and later on I, I visited with some um, colleagues that ended up taking his classes later on, and I told them all about my experience, and they said, well, that's not what we did at all. And as I visited with them later on, I got a chance. He said, well, the course changes from year to year based on the needs of the students, based on their feedback, the types of things that they want to do. And I thought, what a fantastic approach to education, where we don't have the luxury or the option of redoing the same thing from year to year. And as a result, we have the unclassroom. As often as we can involve our students in that process, the more likely we are to engage them as learners. Last thing I think that we can do to incorporate from video games is to use movement. Um, if you take a look at what video games are doing now, the Wii was kind of the fourth runner, the pioneer in movement-based video game systems, which you have Xbox and PS3, which are now doing the same thing with their controllers because they understand that people want to move around and that makes it more engaging. So how do we do that? Well, remember Joe Masiello, he had his kids moving around to remember those words. That's one way we can do that. What if we could do something else? What if we could get our college professors to start adding in movement? Well, Dr. Childress no doubt would go to his students and say, what do you think we could do? And if you survey students, these are some of the, the ideas they come up with to add movement. Let's do some songs and dances to help us to remember stuff. Let's do some more simulations. Let's act it out right here in class, this war. Let's do some skits. Let's role play. Um, students want to be more involved and they want to move around. So why not adapt that from video games and put it right in our classrooms? Here's one thing you could do consistently. Just start to ask students in any content area, class, what would this look like? I visited a classroom where the teacher was doing the drawing and the kids were giving the suggestions. The teacher was very, very quick with the drawing tools and so he'd ask his students, all right, let's, let's create something that will help us remember what parallel lines look like. And this was a class of all boys and the kids were like, motorcycles racing side by side. 
So that's what the teacher drew. And he said, all right, per perpendicular lines. You can probably guess. They've got a theme going. That's right. Motorcycles getting ready to crash into each other. And he says, all right, we studied slope. What would that look like? And sure enough, the kids say, well, why not? Why not have it jumping up a ramp? So these are the non-linguistic representations that the kids create using simple drawing technology tools. Print them up, put them on the wall, save them in a file folder so the kids can review them. But regardless, they're adding movement into the classrooms. Okay? What if you could add in a little technology? Maybe something like this. Hey kids, why don't you act out parallel lines and we'll use our little quick capture camera or my cell phone or whatever, okay, to take pictures of the best ones. Act out parallel lines. Kids lying on the floor, right? Perpendicular lines. Have them acted out. Maybe you could do something like this. Slope, okay? Act out slope and take a picture of it and email it to me or send it to our class website or Flickr account. Have kids act these things out. Create these these stacks of great non-linguistic representations and it's just a fun way to send them out on technology scavenger hunts or, or to act these things out. But add movement and throw in a little bit of technology. Okay? I think uh, my college professor had it right. When you want to add movement, ask the kids what they think would make it more engaging. So to review, if you were in charge of teaching your elderly relative how to use their first smartphone, high stakes, what would you do? Well, we wouldn't lecture we wouldn't make them read. We would use the other tools that are most effective. And I'm not anti-lecture. I'm not anti-reading. I'm saying when it comes to what counts and what counts the most for our students, we should be focusing on not the top, but the bottom of the pyramid because that's truly what's the most effective. The unclassroom does just that. It asks us to look at other models. If we couldn't read all the time with the students or make them read, if we couldn't lecture, what would we be forced to do? If we look at iPods and video games, these are the things that kids say that they enjoy the most about them. They're also sound, instructional, and learning principles. So what should a class look like? Well, Joe says a high Broadway musical. Uh, let's see. Crazy scientist from Montana said what? Angry Birds. That was his classroom. We had the one not too far from here where we said a museum. See it, hear it, touch it, feel it, build it. I talked to folks about a video game. And I don't think it matters as much which model you choose as long as you're focusing on what? Anything but a classroom. This should be the end of lecture as we know it. We know it, it doesn't engage our students. It doesn't make it stick. Classrooms could look like this. They could look like this. They could look like this. But regardless, don't let them look like this. That is the unclassroom.